I'm so grateful this morning to be a part of the family of God and uh, so grateful for these um, young people on our platform this morning. I'm so thankful for all of them. <laughs> Pastor Jeff and Mariah, we've, we've got a future beyond us. Isn't that great? And um, I want to just say I'm, I'm feeling a little bit um, tender this morning for a moment here. I'm, I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for what for you that are our guest here this morning, you know, we, we don't claim to be uh, the best representation of the Lord's body in the earth, but we're close. We love each other. We love the Lord. We're going after truth. We're providing worshipful experiences, and we're asking and allowing God to use us here at home and around the earth, and we're going after God, and we're dealing with the depravity of man, and we are walking in God's grace and mercy, and we are one blessed outfit, I'll tell you. We are blessed folks, amen? We don't have it all figured out because, I mean, you're here, so we don't have it all figured out, do we? I'm here, but we're working on it together, and uh, I'm grateful for all of you this morning. Thankful, Pastor Jeff, for your message last week um, dealing with... Um, Tower of Babel, Nimrod, and uh, man, I just thought what a great word for us to realize that, you know, the uh, majority are seldom right, and, um, and uh, we have to walk in humility and not be about us, but be about God's plan and the sovereignty of God at work in our lives, and uh, thankful for that, thankful for um, just so many things this morning that God, I, I just kind of went through a laundry list of things I was thankful for this morning. As we dive into the Word of God, because I'll get off and then I won't get into this teaching this morning, so I better get going. Uh, I'm being sentimental this morning, but um, I want to just do something together here to start with prayer, and I'd like to um, just all of us to ask the Lord to speak to us specifically something to challenge us and increase our faith through the Bible story this week. Could we just do that? Could we just, if you're comfortable, you don't have to, put your hands out in front of you as kind of like a, you know, kind of like a reservoir of saying, Lord, fill my cup. And Lord, we come to you this morning. And Lord, we just ask you to speak specifically to us. Speak directly to us, Lord. From your, by your spirit, from your spirit, Lord, custom designed things that we need to hear, we need to receive it, act on it, and allow you to accomplish it in our lives. Lord, let this, uh, we're thankful for the service, we're thankful for the gathering of God's people, we're thankful for this moment, but let it be more than just a moment of coming together. Lord, I pray that kingdom stuff would happen today in our heart and the illumination of the revelation of who you are would be greater as a result of what you would do in our hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So we're working our way through the Bible, focusing on Jesus to gain a greater understanding of God's word as we walking through the Bible. And in our Mosaic series, Today's story is oddly profound, and there's so much to it. There's betrayal and sex and scandal. Um, ha have you ever known someone who would do insane things for what they would call love, move across the country with no commitment from the other person? You've never known anybody like that. Quit their job, uh, alienate their friends and family, uh, get a tattoo, I don't know. Do, do some strange things for, quote, love, you know. Here's the context of Genesis chapter 29. Abraham is a sterile old man that God chose to start a nation that would bless the world. Folks, men and women did not write this thing. They wouldn't have wrote that. This had to be under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, right? And he has this miracle baby, Abraham, named Isaac, Isaac has twin sons that are hugely different. Their names were Jacob and Esau. Can you tell I'm diving in? So come on, go with me. We're going to go because I got several things I want to share. I was out of the pulpit last Sunday, and I'm making up for lost time. So hang on. Here we go. 
Esau was a man's man. If I understand uh, the context of who Esau was, he was a man's man. He ate lots of red meat. He liked to hunt. He watched football, and he drove a big truck. <laughs> we also know he was real, real hairy. Esau means red and hairy. What a name to give a baby, <laughs> right? He was also the firstborn of the twin boys, which meant that he got the blessing. In those days, one of the kids, almost always the oldest, got the family inheritance, which means they got the majority of the property and the assets. For the descendants of Abraham, of which Jacob and Esau were, there was this added element of inheriting the promise to bring the promised Messiah, to bring the inheritance of the promise of God, which was that God would use Abraham, that through him would come the nation of Israel, and out of the nation of Israel would come the Messiah, and that through the lineage of the blessing that was passed on through the seed of Abraham would come the Messiah. So the blessing was a big deal. One son in each family carried the messianic seed. And that was Esau. Jacob was the opposite. He was not like Esau. They were twins, but they were probably not much alike. Uh, Jacob was the opposite. He was more refined. He was into fashion. He used a loofah. <laughs> he had special shampoo. He ate tofu ice cream, and he knew not to wear white after Labor Day, and he probably drove a Beamer. I don't know, but Isaac prefers, Isaac prefers Esau and makes that pretty clear, pretty clear, and this is so hurtful to Jacob that he plans a way to steal his brother's blessing. And so at this time, Isaac is really old, dad's really old, and Believes he's going to die, so he says, I've got to confirm the blessing to my firstborn son before I die. And he tells Esau to go into the field and hunt him some venison and prepare it as a stew, and they'll eat it and confirm the blessing. He'll confirm the blessing on Esau, Esau just before he dies. Esau leaves to go hunt for venison, and Jacob sees his opportunity. Isaac couldn't see or hear very well anymore, so Jacob takes a goat and makes a stew. Then he dresses up in Esau's clothes and takes the skin of a goat and attaches it to the back of his arms and his neck, which I don't know what that says about Esau, to be honest. When people impersonate you by covering themselves with a dead goat so that they can smell and feel like you, that is disgusting if you ask me. He walks in and lowers his voice and he says, Hi, Dad, it's Esau. Isaac falls for it and confers the blessing onto Jacob, thinking it's Esau. Esau returns and says, Dad, I'm here. Isaac realized what has happened, but it's too late. The transfer of the blessing was irrevocable. Jacob deceived his dad and betrayed his brother. Jacob's name means deceiver, another odd name to give your baby. That's like calling your baby liar. Hey, liar, come over here. There's my son, liar. They have strange names for people in those days, right? So Esau is fighting mad and vows to kill Jacob. So Jacob hops in his BMW and zooms off. His mom tells him, I don't have this word for word. I'm just doing the best I can in short order here, all right? Just making it real. His mom tells him he has some relatives in a far-off place called Haran, so he heads there. Eventually, he arrives at the house of Laban, his uncle named Laban, which brings us to the main part of the story for today. Laban has two daughters. One is named Rachel. Genesis 29, 17 says she had a beautiful figure and a lovely face. Hebrew for super hot. The other was named Leah. The other daughter was named Leah. She was not hot. I don't know what was funny about that, but struck a nerve. 
The narrator indicates that there was no sparkle in Leah's eyes. So when Jacob first gets there, he's smitten with Rachel. Genesis 29.1 is when Jacob finally gets to Haran where his uncle lives. He arrives as an outcast. Though he's had fancy things, fancy clothes, lots of money, by the time he arrives at his uncle's house, his distant relative, he's lost everything probably but the clothes on his back. He's friendless. He's penniless. And uh, he's an outcast from his dad and his close family. He comes to the village where his extended family lives, his extended family uh, where they live, and, and um, he slumps down on this big old rock that's covering a well. Probably pretty low. Probably pretty bottomed out by now. And the stone, the stone on the well's mouth was large. The Bible makes note of it. When all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds, plural, would roll the stone from the mouth of the well away. And in verse 6, the most beautiful girl Jacob has ever seen comes walking up to the well. In verse 10, after he sees Rachel, he goes over and he single-handedly rolls the stone from the mouth of the well. Little old well-mannered Jacob starts trying to make his muscles bulge out. And he's like, oh, big rock, no problem when there's a beautiful girl around. There's something about a beautiful girl that enables a guy to accomplish amazing feats of strength. Well, they get to taking uh, time to talk and, and uh, getting to know each other, and turns out that not only is Rachel pretty, but they're related. Her dad, Laban, is Jacob's uncle, which makes them first cousins. And we would think that would stop any romantic interest right there. But this is Old Testament. And being cousins with someone was actually a turn-on. I don't know if I should say this or not, but I'm feeling ornery this morning, so here it goes. That is still the case in America and certain parts of Kentucky and Georgia, but um, I apologize. All right, Jacob says to, Jacob says to Laban, I want to marry Rachel. Laban says, well, there's got to be some kind of price for the bride. Jacob says in Genesis 29, 18, that he would work seven years to get her. He's obsessed. And Laban knows a sucker when he sees one, so he agrees, and Jacob works seven years to get Rachel. But these seven years seem like just a few days because of his love for her. Verse 20 tells us that. Amazing. When the seven years are up, Jacob says to Laban, I have finished my years, so please give me my wife. In the original language, it is more than that. He is very straight up about what he wants. Jacob does what a lot of people do who deal with deep disappointment in their lives. They search for the answer to their life's problems in finding that one true romantic love. The time comes for the ceremony. Jacob's bride is wearing the traditional veil. And after the party, he takes his veiled wife back to his tent in the dark, and they spend their first night together. And Jacob feels like for the first time in his life, something has really gone right. And we read in Genesis 29, 25 from the screen, but when Jacob woke up in the morning, it was Leah. What have you done to me? Jacob raged at Laban. I worked seven years for Rachel. Why have you tricked me? Now, folks, what a shock that must have been. Laban's answer was this in verse 26 and 27. It's not our custom here to marry off a younger daughter ahead of the firstborn, Laban replied. But wait until the bridal week is over, then we'll give you Rachel too, provided you promise to work another seven years for me. Now, I would be ticked at this point. 
It's interesting to note that Jacob never insists that Laban honor the contract. I've often thought, why did he not insist that the contract be honored? Most likely it's because Jacob remembers how he had stolen the right of the firstborn from his older brother. Just like Isaac had reached out in the dark thinking it was Esau and Jacob deceived him, so Jacob had reached out in the dark for Rachel and Laban deceived him. The deceiver had been deceived. The trickster had been tricked. Jacob is brought face to face with who he is, but he's so obsessed with Rachel that he's not detoured. And he gets Laban to agree that if he'll work another seven years, that he'll get Rachel too. But after a week, Laban gives Rachel to him instead of making him wait the seven years. How bad this must have been for Leah. All Leah's life, think about this, all of her life, she's grown up in the shadow of her stunning sister. And the only way her dad can get her married off is to get some guy most likely drunk at the wedding party and swap her out in the dark. All her life she's dreamed about being a wife and a mom and now she is that. She really wants to please Jacob. She really wants to make him happy but now he's married to Rachel too. Every day she watches Jacob delight in her sister that she's always been negatively compared to. And we read in Genesis 29, starting at verse 31, When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he enabled her to have children, but Rachel could not conceive. So Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, The Lord has noticed my misery, and now my husband... Now my husband will love me. She soon became pregnant again and gave birth to another son. She named him Simeon, for she said, The Lord heard that I was unloved and has given me another son. Then she became pregnant a third time and gave birth to another son. She named him Le Levi, for she said, Surely this time my husband will feel affection for me since I have given him three sons. Each time Leah has a son, she thinks, now I'll be visible. I want you to start tuning in right now to this story, and not only listen to this story, but begin to listen how the enemy would like to work on our hearts and minds. And think about this message as it might relate to you in principle. Maybe not in the exact replication of the story, but in the principles here. She's thinking each time she has a son, now I'll be visible, I'll be heard, and Jacob will be attached to me. But each time, she's left empty. Do we find ourselves sometimes in life being left empty? In life, we didn't find what we were looking for in that relationship, but maybe in the next one we will. We didn't find what we were looking for in that job, but maybe if we could have that job, we'll find what we're looking for. Not in this city. This is not, that city just isn't working for me, but if I could move, if I could get that house, if I could have that car, if this would happen, maybe then I will feel fulfilled. I, I, will, I will have arrived. If, if, if. You know, if I could get out of this economic bracket and into this economic bracket, everything's going to be wonderful. Or if I could just get out of this stage of life. I mean, this season of life is a bummer. But when I get to that next season, whew, it's going to be awesome. I've had some of that to deal with most of my life. Thinking about the next thing, the next one, the next situation, the next, the next, the next. 
Maybe we're like Leah sometimes. We just keep having sons and think it's going to solve the problem. Another relationship, another attempt, another job, and it always ends up the same. You notice how quiet it's got in the room right now? Because we all relate, right? I mean, we all relate to this to some degree. But then in verse 35, we get the gospel. See if you catch it when I read it. Oh boy, everything's about to change right here. Genesis 29, 35, once again Leah became pregnant. She gave birth to another son. She named him Judah. For she said, now I will praise the Lord And then she stopped having children. This is the best part of the whole story for me right here. She says, now I will praise the Lord. Wait, I don't see the gospel in that verse. It just says she stopped having kids, right? Look in your outline as we fill in a couple of blanks here. See see how Lord is is spelled in all caps here. I want you to put it in your notes in all caps. This is important. That is God's covenant name. The book of Genesis uses two primary names for God. Whenever you see God, it is Elohim, which means the all-powerful one. Lord, in all caps, indicates his covenant name. It has to do with the promises of blessing made to Abraham. The next section of your outline, if someone refers to God as Yahweh, it's because they have come to know and believe those promises. Now, this is going to come together for you in just a moment. Hang on to your seat. The next section of your outline, Leah names her last son Judah, which means praise to the God who has made this covenant with her. In other words... Now, try to grasp this here. Get a hold of this truth because it's, it's mind-blowing to me and it's revelation and it will change your life like it did her. Leah stopped trying to earn the love of Jacob through having sons and received the love of God given to her as a gift. This now becomes the source of her joy. The source of her joy. This is the gospel right here. This this is part of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because she receives the covenant promise of her Lord that causes her to get her praise on and she finds her fulfillment in the promise of God. In the next section of your outline... Judah is going to grow up to be the ancestor. Judah, this is Jacob and Leah's son, one of their sons, is going to grow up to be the ancestor of a very important great, great, great grandchild. Jesus will be the lion of the tribe of Judah. This will be the son through whom Jesus Christ would come. Now let me go off script for a moment. We know that Jacob and Leah had six sons, and they had one daughter. Six, all six of the sons that Jacob and Leah had, each one of them was the name and represented one of the 12 tribes of Israel. We know later on that Rachel did have two other sons, Joseph and Benjamin. Rachel dies after Benjamin is born. She has trouble in childbirth and she dies. The other of the 12 uh, tribes of Israel, the other sons all born through Jacob were from concubines and handmaidens and the 12 tribes of Israel comes through the lineage of Jacob who has been, the blessing has been conferred through his father Isaac, through his father, Isaac's father Abraham. Now here's what's interesting to me. One of the other sons that we talked about just a moment ago from Jacob and Leah was Levi. Through Levi comes the the priesthood of 
that was the tribe of priests, the Levitical tribe of priests. Judah, Judah was the tribe of worshipers. They were the worship team. They were the ones who went first. They were the ones who would go before in battle. And it's interesting to me that you would think Jesus would come from the Levitical tribe, but he didn't. Jesus and his lineage is traced back through worship, through Judah. And when he shows up, coming back again, he won't be a baby in a manger anymore. He will be that lion from the tribe of Judah. It blesses me. Upsets me a little, but mostly blesses me. What's that mean? It means that when Jesus comes back, you won't need me, but you're still going to need your worship leader. Pastor Jeff keeps his job in eternity, and I lose mine. That's not fair. <laughs> We're going to be worshiping the king for all of eternity. So I want to tell you, saints, whatever you're going through in life, whatever's happening in life, learn how to get your praise on. Learn how to worship your Lord. Her ancestry became infinitely beautiful. Not because she had a physical beauty she passed on to them, but because of the gift of God. Now listen to this carefully. Right in the middle of her painful, ugly, unloved life, Leah learned the gospel. She got it long before the famous patriarch Jacob got it. He won't have his gospel moment for several years. She gets it first. And in that moment, she embodies the whole message of the Bible. In your outline, Jacob and Leah both tried to fill the void in their hearts through an idol. What are idols? We really need to learn what idols are because we miss it so much in our Midwestern American culture. We think an idol is some little statue you put on the dashboard of your car. We think an idol is some graven image. We think of an idol as something like that. We need to stop thinking like that and realize that idols are anything we substitute for God. That is an idol. What in our lives do we feel like we can't live without? What is it that you think you need for happiness? Are you Jacob thinking it's romantic love? Are you Leah thinking it's family? Maybe it's the respect of friends. Maybe it's the praise of people. Maybe it's having lots of money. Now, let me tell you this morning, the one who has disappointed me the most and broken more promises to me than anyone else. You want to know who that is? It's me. All idols disappoint because we're made for God. People of God hear this. All idols in our lives will disappoint us because we're made for God. When we begin to worship God and go after him and let him fill that void that only he can fill, then the Lord says, hey, I'll add all these other things to you. You won't even be praying for all these other, and they won't mean as much as, they'll, you'll be blessed, you'll be grateful, you'll be, you'll be humbled by it. But I want to tell you, if you're not humbled by the blessings in your life and by the stuff you have, they might be an idol. I'm humbled by how good God is to me. In myself, I don't deserve anything good. He even made me worthy to receive his glory. 
to be able to pastor and to love you guys and to be some kind of a leader is amazing to me. You all know where I came from. It's amazing. God's amazing. His grace is amazing. His mercy, it's, I don't deserve it. I need to remember this more every day. It'll cause me to be in a better place. It'll it'll cause me to thank God. You know, sometimes my flesh wants to think I've arrived. We always want to have that destination disease. If we could get there, if we could do this, if we could have that, everything's going to be wonderful. How many have lived long enough to realize that ain't true? Some of you haven't lived that long yet. You'll find out. St. Augustine said, Our hearts will always be restless until we find our rest in the Lord. In your outline, Jesus was the one who could give to Leah the unconditional love that she craved, a love that went beyond physical attraction. Let me make this statement here for somebody. Lonely, miserable, insecure, single people become lonely, miserable, insecure, married people when they have idols trying to fill what only Jesus can fill. In your outline, we learn how to receive God's love by faith and stop trying to earn it. Then we become free. The gospel flips everything we believe about love on its head. Jacob chose Rachel because she was naturally appealing, but God chose Leah to bear the Messiah. Isaac chose Esau because he fit his definition of what he wanted his son to be. But God chose Jacob. Listen, I know it was a trick. I know there was deception. But you've got to understand, there is the sovereignty of God at work. And God chose Jacob to be the one through came the ultimate God-man, Jesus. In your outline, God's blessings does not come to those who earn it, but to those who receive it by faith. Paul said this in Romans 9 and verse 16. So it is God who decides to show mercy. We can neither neither choose it nor work for it. It's not because we strive harder. It's all God. Look at Ephesians 2.8. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Do you understand that even the faith you had, if you're saved here today, if you're born of the Spirit of God, if you've been transformed by the power of the gospel, that the faith you have to even confess and truly confess and believe with your mouth and and with your heart, that faith came from God. It was a gift of God for you to have the faith to even believe. You couldn't even do that without Him. It's a gift. There was nothing you could do to earn your salvation, otherwise Jesus would not have to come. Well, pastor, I had to confess him with my mouth. Yeah, but you wouldn't do that if you didn't have faith to believe. And where did the faith come? Faith is a gift from God. That not of yourselves, it is, comes from him. I'm telling you here this morning that this ought to be the most humbling thing. If you're here today and you're saved and you are a child of God and you're going to live forever with the Lord, you, it ought to be so humbling because it, it means that God gave you that gift of faith that you couldn't have it without him giving it to you. You couldn't receive it without him. You couldn't, you couldn't just decide, well, I'm going to get saved today. It don't work that way. If you're here and you're saved and you're a child of the king, it's so humbling. It's a gift. You can't earn it. 
It's not because we strive harder. It's all God. Let me talk especially to the ladies for a moment. Ushers, be ready in case I need help. I want to talk to you ladies just for a moment since this is about Leah. I, 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 uh, let me hide a little while I say this. No. Maybe all your life, some of you ladies, I don't know. Just keep smiling, I won't know. Maybe all your life you've been captive to the Labans and the Jacobs. Maybe some of you ladies are here and voices telling you you're not pretty enough, not good enough, not whatever enough. I want you to know and realize this morning that you have a heavenly Father who has set his love on you and you didn't earn it. Godly dads love their daughter not because they're smart or pretty, but because they're his daughter. In your outline, God doesn't love us because we're valuable. We are valuable because he loves us. God doesn't love us because we're pure. His love purifies us. God doesn't love us because we're strong. We become strong through his love for us. I've never known a dad who saw his kids take their first step and fall and say, my kid's an idiot. I never saw it. I better never either. God loves us unconditionally. One day he's going to make our outsides match the beauty of Christ he put on the inside. Woohoo! Look at 1 John 3, 2. I'm coming in for a landing, by the way. I'm a little ahead of schedule today. I've never experienced that before. <laughs> 1 John 3, 2. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. When we finally grasp these truths, we'll be free of the addiction of the approval of others. Then and only then will Jesus truly be our lifesaver. We won't need anything else, listen, we won't need anything else to feel like we're loved or we have worth. It's Jesus. It really is. You know, I'm preaching this this morning. You know what I'm praying? That my spiritual ears can really hear this too because I need this. I fall short. And then in life, we're free to love someone instead of using them. Can you imagine the gift of being able to truly godly, have a godly love for somebody and not need to use them in any way? Like Leah, our praise and joy is not about how many sons or daughters we have, or whether Jacob loves me, or how smart or pretty we are, but it's our relationship with God. So in your outline, qu the question, what does it take for you to put some praise on to your Lord? Do things have to be going right? Or is your relationship with God all by itself enough? You may want to write this down before you put your notes up, or not. I would recommend writing it down. I'm going to say it twice. How well you understand the gospel is demonstrated by your ability to rejoice in all circumstances. 
I'm going to say that again. I'm going to go slow because some of you need to write it down and ponder on these things. How well you understand the gospel is demonstrated by your ability to rejoice in all circumstances. With or without the wants of your life, Thank God for the beautiful story. Let me say it this way, and I don't mean to be mean. Uh, let, see, let me get this thought out before you go, mm. Thank God for this beautiful story of ugly Leah. It shows us, it shows me that he loves ugly sinners like me. All other faiths, besides the Christian faith, has God at this top of this ladder, and if we climb steps of virtue and works, we can get to him. If we'll be moral, if we'll be hardworking, if we'll make the right sacrifices, be generous to the poor, know our, you know, know our religion, if we do all these things well enough, then the gods will bless us. Literally, every other religion is like that. But the Bible gives us a God who is completely, listen to me now, this is my last thought for today. The Bible gives us a God who is exactly the opposite of that. God loves God. Leah's. Leah's who learned to sing Amazing grace How sweet the sound That saved a wretch like me I once was lost But now I'm found was blind, but now I see. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Praise you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We are heirs of the promises of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That follows to Jesus. Now you say, we are joint heirs with Jesus. All that Jesus has available to him is available to us. May we gain perspective today that everything in this life that's not of you is going to burn up. But what is of you in our hearts will last forever. God, I pray for all of us this morning that we will not put too much weight on temporal things. For we are the blessed of the Lord. And when we put our praise on, we not only glorify you, 
but we gain a realization of the gospel at work in our hearts and who we are in Christ. Thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.